and I'm going to be greedy and ask another question. Yeah. Um, law of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested, like, if you know, to go on this journey. Um, for me personally, mm -hmm. I kind of, without comparing myself to other people, look around and say, other people haven't gone through this emotional processing, yet they still seem to attract things in their life that make them happy and they have what they need. And I'm sort of hoping you can clarify that a little bit. Um, can I clarify a number of things about the law of attraction? First thing is, just because a person see, seems to be happy, it doesn't mean that they're not degrading their own soul condition. Um, to give you an example, a murderer is completely happy doing his murder, but is he harming his own self and is he harming his own soul? At some point, yes, he is. So, so don't be fooled into thinking that just because a person is seemingly happy that it means that, that their soul condition is actually good. Often we attract what we desire, and if what we desire is 25 different relationships this month, um, then we'll probably attract them and we'll probably feel quite happy about that until we arrive in the spirit world and notice our totally ugly features and, and, and also notice that, we, that there's no woman within a 100 kilometre radius of us who would not want to touch us, do you know what I mean, because of what we've done. And so, so don't be fooled into the fact that just because people get what they want here on earth that they're actually getting a pure love-based law of attraction in play. What they're getting is a law of attraction to expose their soul and their desires and that is often very damaging to their soul rather than helpful. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. The second thing to bear in mind with the law of attraction is if I am not sincere, like if my desire is a pure desire and I know my desire in the end is a love-based desire, something that's loving to me and loving to others around me and I'm not receiving it, then it's always because of an emotional injury inside of myself and already my law of attraction will be exposing what that emotional injury is as long as I'm willing to feel it. So what I've found, for example, is like, let's say, um, well, let's say, uh, can I go to uh, our relationship again, probably, when we first met. When we first met, uh, I first met Mary, I was just a little tongue-tied, right? I couldn't really speak to her very well at all. And uh, as she will admit, and, uh, and as I know it's hard to see now, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it was. And, um, he could talk to everyone else, just not to me. Uh, yeah, I, I thought there was some I was actually talking me. in front of a group of 30 or 40 people when I met, met her, but when it came to talking with Mary specifically, it was just blah, 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 and, and nothing came out. And, and that was my law of attraction. My law of attraction is uh, the time I meet my soulmate, I just fall in a heap. That was my law of attraction. Uh, why did I do that? Well, I did that because of a lot of different emotions inside of me that I went home straight away and had to start feeling about. And one of the largest emotions was this terrible feeling that I had that I wasn't good enough for her. And I had to allow myself... It, that was triggered instantly as soon as I met her. Now, I can choose to go home and feel that emotion and actually release that emotion. And as I do that, things change between us. So, so when Mary... She noticed me when we first met, I think. Um, well, mostly because she was invited to come to a talk that I was giving. Um, but, um, but in terms of our own personal interaction, she was severely disappointed with me at the time, I'm fairly certain. No. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted you to talk to me. She, she wanted me to talk to her and I never could. <laughs> and, and, so, um, and so my law of attraction uh, was exposed in that event. And, and this is the beauty of the law of attraction, is that in every single moment your law of attraction is exposing to you something. And the, there is a beauty in the law of attraction. It's so, it's so beautiful that right down to every single minute thing that happens, there is a law of attraction in it. Right down to where you injure your hands when you're working or whatever. Or everything has a law of attraction involved in it. And as long as I'm sensitive enough to it, I can actually know what everything is about emotionally. Now, initially it's hard because, you know, we don't notice as much of it, but, but there is often very obvious things that occur. And if I, in that event, in the event I just described, all I need to do is just feel my emotion. What did I feel? Disappointed with myself, upset with myself. I felt like uh, that, that um, you know, I wasn't good enough for Mary. I felt like uh, I would have loved to have said more. Uh, but I couldn't, 
um, and oh, I had all these like turmoil going on inside, fear, and, and so for, I allowed myself to shake when I got home, and I allowed myself to cry, and I allowed myself to work my way through those, just allowed those emotions to flow in me. Now, in, in that process of that, that releases some of that emotion, which changes my law of attraction. So the next time I speak with Mary, I can actually put two words together, um, maybe not that intelligibly, uh, but st better than I did the first time. And, and then I allowed myself to deal with more emotion. And if we, if we approach every event in our life like that, what will happen eventually is all the things that you do desire that are pure will come to you automatically because you don't have any impeding emotion keeping them away from you. Does that make sense? So, so what was happening with my... My soulmate was drawn into my life because of my desire. I had a desire to meet her. I had a desire for one woman. I'd lived five years alone up until that point uh, without a relationship and I wanted my, I, I was only interested in meeting my girl in the end, That's, that was it. I wasn't interested in anything else. So there was a desire that drew her into my life but there was also this other emotion which was that I'm not good enough for her that repelled her from me in that one instant. And so what I had to do is work through all of the emotions that repelled my desire. Does that make sense? That were opposite to or opposing my desire. And this is where there's a becomes a marrying of desire versus negative emotion. When your desire is actually pure, it won't have negative emotions attached to it. So your law of attraction will automatically bring you the thing you desire. So if it's not bringing you the thing you desire right at the moment, the thing to look at is the emotional impact, the negative emotions that are pushing away these things from coming to you. Does that make sense? Because when you deal with the thing that's pushing you away, your desire is so powerful that it automatically draws to you everything you want. That's what happens. That's how God's designed the entire universe, actually. Yeah. Could I just expand a little on why some you were saying some people seem to just get what they want without having to do any of this emotional stuff? Very often uh, people have a desire and either they don't have any negative emotion attached with that one thing. So some people don't have a lot of emotions about abundance and they attract abundance. But they might have a lot of issues with the opposite gender and so they don't attract a, a relationship that satisfies them in their life. So we have law of attraction about lots of different things. But sometimes people do have a negative emotion attached with whatever this desire is. But they were, and you've seen it in your life, People work really, 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 really hard to get over the emotion um, and they might actually get what they desire in the end but it will have been at the cost of other things in their life. Mm. The beautiful thing about dealing with your emotions is that it just comes to you. Mm. you don't, that's the only work you have to do. So in the end, to live a perfect life, if you could imagine you having your perfect life, to live the perfect life, all you need to have is a pure desire without any negative emotion impacting upon that desire. That's all you need to do. And, and if you have that pure desire in every place of your life, then every part of your life will be fulfilled. The problem that we mostly have is that we have, you know, I have a pure desire for my girl, but at the same time I have all these terrible emotions about when I meet her, how I feel about myself. So my pure desire is now mixed with a heap of negative emotions and that creates my law of attraction. So it took a year before myself and Mary start really connecting with each other because of these emotions. Does that make sense? Like, as, a result, as a result of the fact that I have a heap of these negative emotions that need to be released so that my pure desire, the one that's really there right from the beginning that's just being covered over with all this crap, uh, can be exposed and draw to me everything that I want. Now, now when our desires are uh, unloving, they are just as powerful as when they're loving, in a sense. In the, and, and what I mean by that is that if I have an unloving desire, often that desire can also be met. Right? And if I have no emotion impeding the unloving desire, then I can pull in a lot of unloving things into my life as well. And this is why, like, you see guys, a lot of times they might have three, four, five hundred relationships, you know, in the space of a few years. Let's not call them relationships, let's call them, like, sexual encounters, shall we? And, and they think that's fantastic. Right? In reality, it's an unloving desire 
not impeded by any moral emotion saying well hang on a second you know what how are all these girls feeling about this how am i really feeling about this what's happening to my own soul with all this and so they're exercising their desire in an unloving manner and of course they get exactly what they want and that's how a lot of people also achieve what they want but but when they pass into the spirit world often they have a look in the mirror and they're so totally disgusted with self they can't even face their own reflection um, because of the damage that that desire has done to their soul so the key is we want to make sure our desires are based on love based on truth and when they're based on love and truth go for them every single time every single time you go for them no matter what fear you have you just go for them and you allow the negative emotion in the process of going for them just to come up whatever the negative emotion is so so what I learned to do is go for my desire so one of my desires is Mary go for Mary and allow every negative emotion in myself to come up as a result of me going for Mary and eventually there'll be no negative emotions in me with my desire for Mary and as a result of that our relationship will be just perfect for both of us of course if she has the same desire <laughs> does that make sense yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah thank you no worries Right, thanks. Um, I was watching the DVDs about a month ago about the children parent one, mm -hmm. and I didn't. I was a bit confused because I've got a, a six-year-old with one partner, and Laura's got a two-year-old with another partner. Yes. And I've, in the last couple few few months of processing, we've noticed some changes in the children. Yes. And especially my six-year-old, she's. I felt huge guilt for destroying her whole life and all this kind of stuff, you know, splitting up with her mum and all that kind of stuff and open with her and felt, you know, she's starting to go to school and say, Dad, I felt my emotions today, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I've noticed that there's still, I still have a bit of guilt attached to that, mm -hmm. which I still am working through. But I've noted with, with, with the little one that when is it at the time when they have the when you know you demonstrate free will and all that kind of stuff with the children but when is it when they're actually taking the piss you know because like, they she's she's smart so she'll do things that will just deny every person around her like mm -hmm. she's stubborn and all this yep. kind of stuff when she wants to be and yep. laura doesn't see that much in it but i do yeah yeah it's a very good question yeah. um many children heavily manipulate their parents and, uh, and even if we're another like, oh, yeah, like yeah. a biological yeah. father but yep yeah and attempt to manipulate you as well in yeah. the process yep and and the children do that because already by the time they're two or three years of age they already have a group of emotional injuries in them so um, and but they are also the perfect reflector of what emotional injuries we have as parents so if our child is manipulating us as a parent then it's because we are at some level in, at the soul level attracting that inside of ourselves so so what gender is the child two-year-old they're both girls okay so we've got a two-year-old girl manipulating everyone around her huh? so so and who does she have the most effect on in terms of manipulation if you're talking to them his stubbornness me but i think yeah yeah me. so so okay so so the emotion the person the adult she affects the most is the person that has to work through something so when you see stubbornness in a woman how do you feel angry you feel angry yeah so underneath the anger there must be some fear and underneath the fear there must be some, some grief, grief there. Yeah. and can you see how that relates maybe to something in your own past about stubborn women yes yeah. Yeah. okay so the key is to deal with that emotion in you when you deal with that emotion you'll find when you deal with it at the causal level, the child will no longer be stubborn okay. automatically. Mum might have to look at some of her emotions about men. Because men. Mm. it's a dual law of attraction. Yeah. For <clears throat> me, I'm dealing a lot with losing control. And um, what you were saying, I experienced exactly the same thing today on the treadmill. I was running and all of a sudden I felt this love come into my heart of 
I'm in the presence with, with the soul Jesus who has impacted my life since I was seven years old, yet when I'm with him physically, I would never want to show that because of the judgment and, you know, and what would happen if I really felt my love, I'd appear weak and there's all this like battle with what my heart and how much love is there versus controlling it to dim it or to not, you know, keep it under wraps. So I've got this kind of like, you know, I turn the volume up or I can turn it low. I've got, I've got control over it. So my daughter is controlling and manipulating. And I and see... And in particular controlling the male and attempting to manipulate the male. Yeah. So, and, and I feel it's like some days she'll be all over him, kissing him and everything, and other days she will just, like, totally ignore him. And, <laughs> you know, and I, I, yeah. I see that there's the control in both of us and not wanting to appear weak. So... Even if he takes away a toy that she absolutely loves and I know she's devastated, she'll be like, oh, well, like she won't cry. She won't show that he's allowed. And that's you. That's me. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's very important to see that with every... Remember yesterday I talked about our law of attraction, how there's so many things involved in it. it remember, every single person involved around the law of attraction has a law of attraction that created the event. So if I've got a little two-year-old child being stubborn... Every single person in the room has something to do with that two-year-old child being stubborn. Does that make sense? Yeah, we right live with our parents as well. Like, so, so, so even they have there's, something there's, yeah. to do with that as well. Yeah. And, uh, and who they're being stubborn to is a very important part as well. So if, if it's a little girl being stubborn to a male, then every woman in the, in the room needs to look at their own stubbornness towards the male and the men need to look at how they're reacting in anger towards a stubborn woman. Does that make sense? Every single law, of, everything in the law of attraction is just perfect with regard to every event. So if you can just remember that with your children, what you, you'll work, be able to see things straight away. Now you said, to me, you said in your comment, and one thing I'd like to correct, you said actually that you were working through the issue of control. Your daughter is actually demonstrating to you that you're not working through the issue of control. You're actually living in the issue of control. Well, I feel that I'm living in, like, right now, it, with, with you particularly, I've got the dimmer on. Like, I can feel love in my heart, but I'm con totally controlling it. And the same goes with this man, though, I'm saying. Yeah, with, with every, your partner. With, with it. The with only you. reason why I say you is because if I, when I'm on the treadmill, the, the, the love that, that's there for, for, for Jesus in particular, yeah. being such an impact in my whole life, is, like, you know, like overwhelming and then I'm here and it's like I wouldn't I, I don't want to expose can I, that. Can I put towards you though that while your love for me for your whole life has been strong there are two loves that should always have been stronger and you've got to look at why they're not there's the love that you have for God that needs to be stronger than any love you have for me and then the love you would have for your soulmate needs to be also stronger than any love you have for me and there's a reason why those loves aren't stronger and why you've focused your love on me rather than those. Yeah. I think I've, I, will, I know because I've experienced it today that the reason why I focused my love on you is because you had the attributes that I most, um, that I most admired and it was, your passionate desire for God is what has always driven me whereas God doesn't have a passionate desire. for like I, can't, I don't connect with that. Well, God does have a passionate desire for you. But the issue is you're not feeling that and you're also not feeling your own passionate desire for God for some reason. And I'll suggest to you that it's actually partly about this yes. issue, about the male. Can I just reflect something that I feel, Laura? It's about vulnerability with a man. You feel um, okay to be vulnerable with AJ because he uh, represents to you a safe, loving man. And it's the same issue with God and with your soulmate, is the feeling that with the man who's my soulmate, I'm afraid to be vulnerable because I can't trust he's going to have the beautiful attributes that I see in Jesus. So it's this feeling of like, uh, and it's the same thing then reflected onto God. I can't trust that God will do I have this other anchor there that I feel it's okay to express love to and experience love for. But... It's the, and I have the same experience of feeling very afraid to be very vulnerable with my heart um, in a, because it doesn't feel safe that the man will love me back. Mm. Yeah. And, and frankly, God far exceeds anything I'm ever going to be. So, so, so the fact that you feel some resistance towards God 
is, is an indication that there are a group of emotions there to work through with regard to the opposite gender. And, and while it's lovely that you see my nice qualities, um, it, your focusing on them, is an, it, it can be used to avoid the two greater loves. And the two greater loves are the love for the other half of yourself and then or the greater love than that is the love for God. And, and a lot of people historically and religiously have focused their love on me, Jesus, and in the, and in the process avoided these greater loves that are there, uh, that are there ready for them. And often, well, with regard to the greater love of God, of course, that's always there ready for, for you. I think I've projected my, um, my soul injury with my father onto God and onto my partner. That's and exactly you what you've done. The safest. That's, and so I become then the safest male that you know. And, and so, so therefore easier to love. But actually that's not looking at the fact that you're, it, when you do that, you're actually neglecting the development of two far greater loves than I can ever give. Does that make sense? Yes. And the, like, obviously, for Mary, it's the same thing. So for Mary, the greatest love she can ever experience will be her love with God and then her love with me as her soulmate. They are the two greatest loves. And then any other person is always going to be a lesser love. Now, if, now if the other person, we have a greater love for somebody else, anyone else, it's because a lot of the times we have, are deeply avoiding the actual two greatest loves that we're being offered. And, um, and even if our soulmate is in the poorest of all conditions, our soulmate still has the capacity to grow from that place to give us the second greatest love we can ever experience. And, um, and so that, that's why in the end it's very, very good to take the focus away from myself and then start looking at, all right, these are the two greatest loves I want to develop. Let's focus on why those loves, why I have a deep feeling that I can't be vulnerable to those loves. And as you've correctly identified, it's the issues with the father, male type figures that, that cause that to occur. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I just want to ask about soulmates. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know where to start, but just that you can meet, have many partners in your life and have a loving relationship, but um, how do you actually know when you've actually <laughs> met your soulmate, or um, do you always meet a soulmate in your life? And um, I, I suggest that you listen rather than me answer the question briefly. There's a talk. Uh, there's actually eight hours of talk I gave just recently about the soulmate relationship and how you attract the soulmate relationship into your life, and what kind of relationship it actually is. It's very, very different to any love-based relationship you'll have ever previously experienced. And it's very, very unique. And it's not something after you've experienced it that you would ever want to, ever want to exchange for any other relationship. Uh, it, you don't have more than one soulmate. So, so the way God created you is that there is just the other half of you. The soulmate is actually the other half of you. And so, and when I say the other half of you, the other half of your soul, you are actually only one half of the complete unit that makes up your soul. And you could say then that a soul is really like two persons, if you like, in, or one body in two different persons. How did, how did Aristotle say it? I can't remember now. But, um, but basically, that, the soul is like two bodies in, in one person, really. And... Uh, <laughs> that wasn't it either. Yeah. But it's true, isn't yeah. it? It's and one person in two bodies. Is one, that what you said? Two, yeah. yeah, two bodies, one person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. opposite the way you just said yeah. it. Yeah. But, um, but the, beauty, the beauty of the soul relationship is that, is that you can't mimic it. You can't ever create it with somebody other than your soul mate who is actually your true partner. Now, now in uh, the recordings that you can download for free from the internet so that's on www.divinetruth.com and there's a section I gave in there on soulmates and I discuss how you attract your soulmate what kind of relationship it is what kinds of things happen in your soulmate relationship and all those kind of things and eventually where your soulmate relationship is actually headed um, because it's headed into that soul union state where you become one being and as one being uh, acting 
And it requires giving up lots of different desires that we often have on earth that are out of harmony with love. And a lot of our desires we have on earth is this desire for independence. The soul has a desire for independence as a combined unit, not as two separate halves. And so I don't have a desire for independence from Mary, for example. And as we grow in the soul union, we will have less independence from each other, but we will have more independence from every other person. So we become a unique individual as one unit. And I've described all of those things in, that kind, in, in those presentations. I'll be giving more presentations about the soulmate union as well because there's so much, many questions that people have had about it. But uh, can I just point out too, with the soulmate uh, relationship, it, it will be the most challenging relationship you've ever experienced as well. And this is the reason why most people don't easily uh, uh, attract it, is because they often meet their soulmate but feel deeply repelled by the opposite emotions in them that they actually uh, have a sort of almost a love-hate relationship with their soulmate. And that's because of all the unhealed intergender emotional injuries that we hold inside of ourselves as a human race that we are unwilling to resolve many times while we're here on earth and many times we don't resolve for many, many thousands of years in the spirit world either. So my suggestion is to investigate a lot about it and that's why I say rather than giving you a five-minute answer, if you could have a listen to that sections on soulmate, you'll have a far better concept of what the soulmate relationship is really about. It's definitely not what the New Age people teach you it's about. So it's not a meeting of a person, all of a sudden realising that's the one for me and forever we live happily ever after. It's not like that at all. And it's particularly not going to be like that while we hold so many intergender emotional injuries as a human race. If we didn't have them, it would be like it that. It would be like that if we didn't have those emotional injuries. The, the truth is actually that when you open the soulmate part of your soul, you will never desire a relationship with any other person, even if you're not with your soulmate. So um, once the soulmate part of your soul completely opens, uh, you, will, you will usually, once you have a pure desire to know, know who your soulmate is and you will never desire another person. And when I say never desire, I don't just mean never emotionally desire, I also mean never sexually desire or have any other desire for another person in that bounding, binding relationship. Your entire sexual drive disappears altogether. Right? And then when you meet your soulmate, it returns. Right? And so you can have no sexual drive for five, six, seven years. Well, for me, it was five years. I, had, I was not living with anyone, had no sexual desires whatsoever. And then when I meet my soul mate, all of a sudden, it was, the sexual desires were immediate along with all the other desires. So um, it's not like you're sort of test driving a whole group of people to find out which one of them is your soul mate, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. Um, the, the truth is if you open the soulmate part of your soul, you would never feel open to test driving everybody else before you meet your soulmate. Because this, is part, this part of your soul, when it opens, it has a very deep sensitivity to who isn't your soulmate as well. And as a result, it cannot sexually connect with those people. And, uh, and therefore, you cannot have a relationship with them. You can have a friendship with them, that kind of relationship, of course. And a, every, we can have a loving relationship with everyone. But I'm talking about the unique, erotic and fr deep, deep soul-based friendship that is not possible with anyone else other than your soulmate. And God created it specifically that way so that you could be eternally happy. And, uh, and it's just a beautiful gift that God's given all of us as humans to have our other soul half available to us. But it's certainly nothing like the New Age movement explains to you. Um, and nothing like the majority of people on earth ever experience in a relationship. The truth is that most of our relationships on earth are very much based on codependent addictions. And when I meet your addictions and you meet my addictions, then we all feel happy and we all like each other. And then as soon as I don't meet your addictions, then we feel unhappy. And that's how most relationships on the planet are. And the soulmate relationship is not like that. In fact, soulmate relationship grows to a point where you do not have 
any codependency. You don't have any addictions being met by the partner. The partner meets none of your addictions at all, in fact. So it's almost totally opposite to most of our relationships that we've ever experienced on Earth. Thank you. And Joy, and then we'll go right up the back there. Is that only after you've dealt with your own injuries? You just said that your soulmate doesn't satisfy any of your addictions. No, I said, remember what I said is that when you open up the soulmate mm -hmm. half of your soul, mm -hmm. no other person can satisfy you in, in any way mm. and, and your soulmate certainly is the only person you're open to. When you become at one with, with God, and uh, you will get into this state where you won't even have your soulmate satisfying any of your addictions. Oh, so you grow closer together even yeah. though the addictions aren't being satisfied. So in other words, let's say I've got an addiction as a male to be uh, sexually desired by females. That might, when I open up the soulmate part of my soul, I will have that addiction will translate into an addiction to only be sexually desired by my soulmate. When my soulmate comes along, she probably won't desire me sexually. And that will trigger that addiction and I will release it. And when I release that addiction, my soulmate will start desiring me sexually. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and the, the way God created our relationships uh, are in such a manner, the soulmate relationship is in such a manner that if we allow it, we can actually use the soulmate relationship to grow immensely spiritually. If we, did, if we both desire God. Obviously, if, if we, we both desire, desire God. God and growth, we could reach a point in our relationship where we are satisfying each other's addictions, still be soulmates, but never experience a soulmate relationship. So, so what I'm so saying is the soulmate relationship, it does not have codependency. It does not have addictions being met. So if a, soul, if a pair of soulmates do have, so if we as soulmates do have a codependent addiction, in that particular area, we are not yet in a soulmate relationship. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? So we might be soulmates living in a relationship, right. but we are not yet in a soulmate relationship until we remove these codependent addictions that we have with each other. That makes sense. Yeah. So you can actually meet your soulmate and live in a completely codependent addiction state, mm. but that's not a soulmate relationship. Mm. A soulmate relationship is living with your soulmate, but in a totally like, non-addictive state. Just me giving the gift of my love to my girl, she giving the gift of her love to me in the case of our heterosexual soul partnership. And you're suggesting that um, you're better off to work through your own injuries with your soulmate? Well, um, firstly, there'll be a group of emotional injuries you'll need to work through before you even attract your soulmate. And those emotional injuries are primarily surrounding how you view the opposite gender. And it's not how you think you view the opposite gender, it's how you actually feel about the opposite gender, which are often two very different things. So, for example, I might have a feeling towards the opposite gender, yes, I want to have a relationship with a person of the opposite gender. But I also may have, at the same time, deep emotional anger about you know, what my father had done in my childhood towards me. Now, that emotion is being projected at all males, including if I had a heterosexual soulmate and I'm a female, um, uh, I'd be projecting it at my soulmate, unbeknown to myself. So what my soulmate's feeling from me is a rejection of himself as a male. And, and so he will not be attracted to me in that state. Another condition might be um, that as a male, I might have a very strong neediness for a woman's nurturing. And this might be because uh, when I was a child, uh, my mother never really nurtured me very much. And so I then start projecting that out. Now, once I connect to and open that soulmate part of myself, I will then have that soul projection going to my soulmate. Now, that will actually reject my soulmate. It won't attract her. The reason why it doesn't attract her is because she's got a role before she begins our relationship, and that role is to nurture me, and that role is, an, is not a loving role. And so what happens is that she would feel that as a repulsion. And so uh, while, I don't in, while I don't heal that injury inside of myself, I'm actually repelling my soulmate from my life rather than attracting her to me. So, so can you see how like, there's so many different emotions that could be at play, all from our childhood, generally with the opposite gender parent, uh, that reject our soulmate from coming in our life. 
the irony is when that soulmate does come in our life, then we all, when we usually then have a whole group of emotions about how we feel about ourselves that start getting triggered as well. And then we, and that's the ideal time to have the soulmate come to your life when you, when, when you start working through your own emotions about yourself and how the opposite gender feels about you. Yeah. Which will happen automatically. Yeah. So even though you might feel, as I know you occasionally do, that even though you know who your soulmate is, that um, you know he's going to be away from you for many years, the truth is actually he's only away from you until such time as you deal with the intergender emotional injury you feel towards the male. And as soon as that occurs, he will automatically be drawn to you no matter what situation he is living in and no matter where in the world or in the spirit world he is. Cool, eh? Yeah. It's a cool system. <laughs> God creates cool systems. That's <laughs> says, God is the coolest. God's the coolest, yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. If we... A lot of questions. Feel free to go whenever you want, by the way. What, what is the time? 9.30, yeah, we'll need to finish shortly. So you can't actually have a soulmate with the same sex? Yes, you can. can. Oh, you can. Uh, remember I pointed out that we are a heterosexual soul couple or a soulmate partnership, but there can be homosexual soulmate partnerships, yes. Um, uh, they occur. Um, when you drew the male and the female, though. Yeah, remember I said, that, uh, remember I said at the time about 80% of the time that's what occurs. Oh, yeah. And what happens with the actual soul, if, uh, and I've explained this before in other discussions that you might want to listen to about the soul and how it's constructed, but the truth is that the way souls are constructed is that each soul has a complete sexual bias as well as an in, there's two halves have a sexual bias. So, for example, there's a whole range of souls. If I drew it in a bell curve, uh, which is like this, if this is dominantly female and this is dominantly male, the complete soul union can be dominantly female or dominantly male or half and half. So when the complete soul unit is dominantly male, when it splits, it attracts two male bodies. When the complete soul unit is dominantly female, when it splits, it attracts, or of female, it attracts two female bodies. And when the complete soul unit is like, in most of the cases, about, like I said, about 80% of the cases, the complete soul unit has a mixture of male and female qualities mostly, then it attracts a male body on one side and a female on the other. So the truth is that the soul uh, can certainly be homosexual in nature. Um, none of the souls in the spirit world view themselves as homosexuals in, in nature because in the end it's just a complete unit, one unit, not two. So in the end it's just a soul union that occurs between the two halves. So the truth is there is no such thing as sexuality uh, with the human soul. It is instead... I would call it soul modality or soul or <laughs> something like that. Our sexuality is determined by our soulmate attractions. And when we have a bisexual uh, sexuality, we are actually not in tune with our soul. Uh, we also can often have a, soul, uh, a homosexual attraction or a heterosexual attraction that is actually not a soul-based attraction. There are many people who believe themselves to be heterosexuals on the earth but find out when they pass into the spirit world that their soul was actually a homosexual soul. And there are many people who have lived on earth um, as homosexuals and yet passed and then found it was only because of emotional injuries that they were living in that place. But there are still pure soul unions that are homosexual in nature. Is there always a sexual connotation or can you have two best friends? Like is there like two girls or two male or mainly two... Is it, is it always a, a, sex, there's a sexual desire, a sexual longing? Okay. Often, often on earth we detune from that. So you, often you'll see, for example, a, a, homo, a lesbian homosexual soul couple which are pure. Like they, uh, often you'll meet, we'll meet a couple and we go, wow, they're they they are actually soulmates. Um, they don't know it. They have a deep friendship that they're not allowing any sexual connection between each other because of their emotional injuries and because of, you know, the societal beliefs and so forth. And, and that often does happen, where people have a deep friendship that's lasted all of their life, 
but actually, um, but actually they haven't allowed the sexual part of that friendship to develop because of their own emotional injuries. So the, tr the truth is actually that um, many times we find that um, on, the, on this end of the scale, on the mostly dominant male end of the scale and mostly dominant female end of the scale, there are many emotional injuries that determine how they e eventually get together. There is still a lot of emotional stigma on the planet about homosexuality. And as a result of that, um, there is a lot of unloving projections that, that these people feel right from the moment of their, inca of their incarnation. And, uh, and so therefore have a lot of confusion about their sexual life. And so many of them finish up feeling they're bisexual, for example, or, or have other types of uh, sexual preferences that we often think are strange. But um, in reality, it's because of the detunement from the true soul's condition, because as a society, we, are, we have a lot of sexual repression. Yeah. And, and that causes lots of problems. And... Uh, the beauty is, is that if we are a homosexual soul couple that's male-male in the spirit world or even on earth, as we deal with our emotional repressions, we will automatically attract our soulmate anyway. And if we were, had, if we were on, the, on the homosexual female end of the scale, the lesbian end of the scale, what would happen there is that as we deal with our soul-based injuries toward the masculine and towards the feminine, we will automatically start attracting our soulmate anyway. So... So most people do have a knowledge of their own sexual preferences. And the sexual preference is actually not determined by anything physically, but rather is determined by the soul's desire. Yeah. In other words, by the soulmate relationship. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, there's been a fellow up there. It's off the subject. Is there still soulmate questions? Is this a soulmate question? Sexual projection, so sexual question, and then we'll go off the subject. Um, I was just going to ask a question. What is with um, people sexually projecting that someone should be homosexual or not? So say someone knows that they're heterosexual, but there's um, other, say, homosexual people sexually projecting at them or telling them that they are homosexual. They think that they're yep. homosexual. Yep, very good question. When they're not. Yep, and... Um, what, what is guiding it is a lot of very, very um, strong power-based emotions generally. Almost all of our sexual uh, emotions are not really sexual in nature. They're usually based around other things. And for, for many people, uh, sexuality is based around power, control and safety. And so, for example, uh, many women, for example, project sexually at a male who's bigger than them. And the reason why they do that is that uh, the male feels, if they're bigger than them, they, they believe that they'll be able to be protected and be kept safe and secure by this bigger male. And so therefore, they project sexually at them in order to have their attention. So they equate, because they carry that injury, I'm not safe as a woman, when that injury is allayed or when the fear is allayed, then they become sexually aroused or they feel sexually attracted. When in a pure sense, if they didn't have that injury, their sexual attraction might be to any other kind of male. Might be a male shorter than them, for yeah. all we know, yeah. you know what I mean? But, but while they have that injury, that, that, that attraction will result. Now, when it comes to a person projecting sexually at a person that is not the same sexual persuasion as themselves, so in other words, a homosexual male projecting at a heterosexual male or a homosexual female projecting at a heterosexual female, that is, that is often determined, what's often determined, determining that is this deep feeling inside the person that they want to have an unattainable relationship. And this comes from big emotional childhood injuries about the unattainableness of a relationship with usually the same sex parent. So for example, the homosexual male projecting at a heterosexual male wanting a relationship with him when the male, the heterosexual male knows he's heterosexual is caused generally because the homosexual male hasn't had a very good relationship with his father in, in, on, in, in, in his childhood. And he's looking for specific things as a result from an unattainable male in, in a sexual way. And the same usually applies uh, on the female uh, homosexual projection. All sexual projections actually fall into this category. So 
So, so even if I'm a heterosexual male projecting at anyone who's other than my soulmate, a, a, a woman who's other than my soulmate, I am actually acting out a childhood emotional injury rela related to my mother that I need to repair. Or a childhood injury related to my belief about myself in reference to the mother that I need to repair. And, and so when we look at all of these intergender emotional injuries, they all affect the outcome of our sexual relationships. So the sexual relationship is actually an effect. It's not actually a cause of, of things. A lot of times in, in society we've viewed it as a cause, but in reality the sexual relationship is usually a deep effect of our childhood emotional injuries along with childhood emotional pure desires that are a part of our soulmate pure, pure attractions. So, so we get this mixture of stuff going on uh, that causes lots of different emotional injuries in our life that then causes us to have all sorts of sexual projections at people and sexual attractions that once we release the injury, we no longer have. So many women have found, for example, that once they release the injury of wanting to be safe and secure, in other words, needing somebody else to create their safety and security, they are no longer attracted to the men that they believed they were, the type of man they believed they were attracted to before. And the same applies for many men. So uh, many times we are attracted to um, either the opposite, the direct polar opposite of, or a, a representation of our opposite sex parent. And once we heal the emotional injury, we're no longer attracted to that. And now we can feel our pure soul desire, whatever that is. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. No worries. I'm going, am I going down the back? Yeah. Um, I've got something that's been not troubling me for a while, but it's, I find it very interesting. I've got a four-year-old daughter, yep. um, and she often calls me at work asking when I'm coming home from work, and uh, can you come home now, can you stay at home? Um, everyone else's daddy stays at home, and just stuff like that. Um, can I ask whether she's, is she, you're living, is she, you're in a partnership? No, no, you yes, know, yeah. You know her. Bethany. Oh, it's Bethany. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, yeah, get heaps of phone calls, um, come home, come into the lounge room and she just goes mental and yeah. um, it's like no one else exists. Whenever I have to do something that she associates with pain, e.g. having a bath when you're told to have a bath or going to bed or something like that. I cannot have any part of it, but Grandad can come in and wash her or Mum can wash her, um, Grandma yeah. can wash her, the cat yeah. could wash her, the dog <laughs> could wash her. Yeah. I couldn't wash her. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's something... There's so is it something that she finds unpleasant? Is that what you mean by the pain? No, thing? no, she just wants somebody... I, I don't know. Just any I, task she wants someone There's actually to two things yeah. happening yeah. Um, that I can feel. There's something happening for you yeah. and there's something happening for your wife. Is What's your name again? Nicole. Nicole. There's two things happening. One is, uh, for, can I address your emotions first, Nicole? Is that all right? <laughs> okay. Um, your daughter is acting out a lot of your emotions towards your husband that you are not allowing yourself to act out. Um, so while you suppress them, what happens is she acts them out for you. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So, so when she wants to ring up Daddy and tell him to come home now, the key for you there would be to actually feel what you're feeling in that moment. Can you feel the feeling you were feeling in that moment most of the time? Can you feel what it is? Yeah. You feel quite overwhelmed at times, don't you? And you feel like you need somebody home with you to help you out. And, and what she's doing in that particular moment is acting out that emotion. So, so what you can do, actually, is just allow yourself to feel your feeling of being overwhelmed rather than trying to shut it down. I know with children there is this belief that people have that if we show our children our emotion that it's actually damaging to their children. But the reality actually is quite different. When you actually allow yourself to feel your own emotion that you feel quite overwhelmed, that's when your children feel the most safe because they're not receiving that projection from you. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. So if you can allow yourself to actually feel your own emotion 
about how overwhelmed you're feeling in that particular moment, what will happen is she will feel quite safe and she won't feel like calling yeah. daddy in that moment. She'll just let mummy have her cry or whatever mummy needs to do and she'll play probably quiet, quietly uh, without bothering you while you do it. Um, now, often it's quite confronting to parent that way, you know, compared to what we've been taught how to parent. So uh, just to, to allow your emotions to flow rather than shutting them down and denying them. But if you experiment with that, you'll find that straight away things will change and that will give you the feedback that you need. Wow, I'm the, on the right track here. Yeah. Does that make sense? The other question that you had, though, was about... Uh, what was your name again? Chris, <laughs> that's right. Um, the other question you had, though, Chris, was about... Um, about bathing and other, other things like that. Now what's happening here is again a bit of reflection of mum's emotion, but it's also towards the male and how you feel as a male around women. And you actually have some feelings of uh, discomfort um, inside of yourself around women at times, and particularly around women's bodies, if I can be specific. Um, do you feel that at all? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> And, and in particular about, um, and this is affecting the relationship with daughter, in, uh, the reason why she doesn't want you, to, cha you know, to change her clothes or be a part of her dressing and all these other things that are going on. And the key for you is just to notice it inside of yourself again. And remember that um, these are no judgments, by the way. This is, this is just your child reflecting back at you at any one point in time and emotion. That's all that emotion that I'm denying in myself. Now, I know as a father for myself, um, there were times when I was in quite a lot of confusion about what's the right thing to do with this little child that I've had no experience in raising before this particular point came along and nobody's taught me how to raise and, and I don't know sometimes how to interact with them or, and, and even how to do things like bathe them or, or, or other things like that. And, and I have some degree of discomfort but sometimes about what people project at me as well. Uh, in other words, often with a, with a male, with mothers, mothers often are allowed to bathe their children and even uh, bathe the child's private parts and, and sexual parts and everything with, uh, uh, with, no, with immunity from being accused of any harm. And yet, if a father does exactly the same thing, he's often accused of harm. And so um, often, uh, as guys, we become quite afraid of what we're going to be accused of, what we're not going to be accused of, you know, and all these kind of things. And there are a lot of uh, gender-based uh, judgments uh, towards the male about rearing children. And if, if you can allow yourself to actually let yourself feel about some of those and your discomforts there, you'll find she will feel very comfortable with you um, and, and very comfortable with you bathing her or put chain, you know, putting new clothes on her and things like that, just as she is with, with the others in the family. So that, that's the other thing to do too, um, as a, and this is just a recommendation as a couple, is to see what she's playing out with each of you individually actually reflects a lot of the belief systems that you have about the opposite gender. So this is the beauty of our children, is they are perfect reflectors. They're just so beautiful at reflecting everything perfectly. So if you can allow yourself to just notice the, the, what she's reflecting at that one instant. So you, know that re you, you could easily feel, Nicole, couldn't you, when I said, ah, oh, right at that moment when she calls Daddy, what are you feeling? Straight away you twigged, like I could see that emotion run through you of, yeah, I know what this is about. And what, if you allow yourself to do that all the time with your, both of your children, because you, you've got the blessing of having a boy and a girl, which means a very balanced, like, you've got to get a very balanced reflection from the male and the female as to what you can work on together. And, and if you can allow yourself to see those reflections and allow yourself to just feel the emotions and release those emotions, you'll find that things will change very rapidly with the children. And, and they'll, they'll, they will um, change, they'll seemingly even change sometimes in personality, when in reality it's not personality, all they're doing all the time is just reflecting our own denied emotion. Does that make sense? Um, um, you wanted to say something? Because there was one other point I wanted to raise. No, I, I was just going to say, it's, it, 
It can be a really amazing process. We know quite a few couples with young children who are just taking the advice AJ's giving and it's quite beautiful to observe how the family grows together. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and understand that everything that they, that they um, act out between each other also is a reflection of what's going on between you two as a couple. So um, if, can I be even more <laughs> blunt than I've been so far or how far do you want That's me to fine. go? You're okay? Um, um, allow yourself, but allow both of yourselves to open up more sexually towards each other. Um, as you know, there's some things going on there uh, in your relationship, and and if you can allow yourself to open up more and challenge some of those emotions that you feel, um, and myself and Mary will be doing some presentations soon about how to do that in a practical way. Um, it will help a lot with your relationship and it will also help a lot with what your daughter in particular at this point but later your son might act out in the future. The reason why is that often, often when we have children um, there are a lot of emotions that come into play about our sexual relationship as a couple and, and if we can allow ourselves to work through those emotions it has a fantastic effect not only on the relationship but also has a fantastic effect on allowing the children to have their own sexuality develop freely. As soon as we start shutting down things between each other sexually in the relationship, what finishes up happening is in the, the, ch the children also begin shutting down those things inside of themselves and, and that creates a sexual damage in our children. So by the time they get to teenagers or adults, they're starting to act out that damage. And so if you can allow yourself to address those issues that have just come up since the birth of their children, um, that would be really great for the, both of you too. And by the way, no one has said anything to me about that. I'm just going by what I feel from the both of you, um, which I do pretty much all the time. So if you can al allow that, those things to be looked at as well, and I, um, I'm not being, going to be more specific than that. I think you both can know what I'm speaking about. And, uh, and what will happen is you'll find that uh, things will really grow tremendously uh, between, between the two of you, but also the children as well will actually have a lot of growth as well in the process. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking the question, Chris. Now, it's getting close to 10 o'clock, you guys, and, and tomorrow we're leaving in the morning, so um, we're probably going to cut short things now. Um, is there any spirits just before we do who wanted to ask questions that, yeah? And um, do you mind addressing some of those questions? Or? By the way, we'll be coming back uh, at some point. We've just really enjoyed uh, visiting and, and meeting all of you. And uh, so we feel that we'll probably be coming back before the end of the year again and having a chat with you again. So, um, and, uh, and, hopefully any of the other questions you have. There's, there's over 300 hours or so of, of presentations that are downloadable on the net um, that you can listen to and many of your questions, have, have every single question that you've asked tonight pretty much has been asked before and I have actually answered it in a presentation at some point. So um, you'll find that many of your questions are probably already been answered. And, uh, and if you have a listen to those presentations, a lot of the questions that you have now might get answered too. But what I wanted to do just briefly is give the spirits an opportunity to ask any questions um, if, if they have any. And, and if they don't feel like they want to, then that's fine too. And we can finish off, finish off now. Um, all I want to express is there's about 10 people here who have the ability to channel. Yep. Um, that channeling was my first ever yeah, open, channel. open one in front of others. In yeah. front of others. Yeah, because um, I've only commenced. Late. And it's great you've bitten it off, Fanto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of emotions that I yeah. need to feel, and today has been very heavy for me. Yeah. Um, that I haven't really allowed to experience. Yeah. Because um, I just keep getting shut down. Yeah. As well. Um, you remind me a little of James Paget. He was a lawyer too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Scary thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a shock for a lawyer to start channeling, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so with, with, well, I can 
honestly say the way it happened with me was um, complete body shutdown. Yeah. In my own profession, I just couldn't do my job anymore. Yeah. Um, yep. It just got to the point where I can't. And I've got a lot of emotions related to that still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just can't uh, keep implementing the effect. It's a constant suppression. Yeah. Um, and, and sooner or later it hurts the soul so much that you've just got to stop. That's right. Yeah. And um, it's just an awakening. Yeah. Instant awakening and an instant realisation that there are other things around me. Yeah. Um, and it came because of my niece. She yeah. uh, just had an expression of uh, description of demons that are around who are getting fat around me and so forth. Right. That's wow. scary. And I would feel drained yeah. um, at those times. So two and two. You could put it together. Yeah. And then I started to have some realisations with me early childhood, living on the farm, I was very connected and I've always been intuitive, yeah. understood results before I met the clients, I'd know really what the outcome is and yeah. what they're hiding from me. Yeah. Um, and Handy how, if you're a lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> and how dishonest they are and how they just want me to, to actually allow them to continue being in their um, yep. Yep. suppression. Yeah. And I couldn't do that anymore, so yeah. speaking the truth is actually a difficult element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of spirits, the one that you spoke to yesterday, um, it, Kiro, I think his name is, yeah. he's at the moment in the fifth sphere. Yep. He did a lot of work last night. Yep. And um, he expressed that he'd like you to have a look at your, you're ready to deal with your emotions regarding your eyesight yep. and for you to open up and see other things. Yep. Um, and particularly to start working with them, the six fear um, spirits, they'd like to be able to assist also first fear, second sphere individuals because they can see the impact that they've had. Mm -hmm. They've always believed that um, that their teachings was the way in order to achieve natural love. And they've, through your work, they've, got, they've understood that they're not God because they can't actually impact the soul. Yeah. And they haven't been dealing with their own souls yeah. um, and they ha couldn't create, they can't create another being, they can't create their own soul. Yeah. So they do realise they're not God and so they've been really challenging their own truths. Yeah. Um, but they also see that the impact of what they've been doing, they thought it was a loving action, has it had a huge detriment on a lot of people. Yeah. And they want to start working from that angle. Yep. Um, and they don't quite know how to do it but they're lined up in the thousands. <laughs> no worries. Um, my um, my feelings about it are that, um, and this is primarily for their for, for, for the discussion with them, is that um, um, the I, I would love to work with them. At the moment, for me, um, I would prefer to do it through a medium who's willing to work with them as well, um, and. Um, and that requires my, me respecting another person's desire on earth who is willing to connect with them and remain connected with them through this process. And, and my, my problem that I've found uh, most of the time is that many mediums haven't had that pure desire to work with both myself and with the spirits who are involved. And because of that, it, it's often difficult to work with them. Certainly in the spirit world, I can work with them. But, but my first, uh, as they already know, that I've attempted to work with them in the spirit world on a number of occasions. And um, as they already know, one of the reasons why I've spoken to them about my resistance to working with them is, is about their, their resistance to dealing with some of their causal emotions which impacted upon their choices. And because if they can deal with those causal emotions, what will happen is that their desire will ramp up even further and we'll be able to work very rapidly with these first and second sphere spirits that they've had an impact upon. And so, so what I feel from them quite strongly at times is this desire to help the first and second sphere spirits that they have actually harmed as, and they can see now that they've harmed, but they're also, also at the same time a strong desire for them to still continue to avoid the emotional reason why they made the choice that they made to initially impact them in a negative way that they had done. Does that make sense? So. And, and 
this individual in particular, yep. he would like to know is it more beneficial for him once he completes his emotional clearing in the fifth sphere and he returns back to the sixth, yep. um, that he continues to progress towards the seventh or does he commence teaching the other six spheres? Spirits well, at that point, and he said that you'd have a greater audience at that point once he's reached that. Yeah, um, I feel at the moment there are many thousands of six sphere spirits that I have spoken to that have progressed beyond the sixth sphere into the seventh, and have also become at one with God in the eighth. And and many of them have attempted to go back to the sixth sphere, um, but the problem with as he will soon find out when he re-enters the sixth sphere. The problem with it is when you've made this shift from the intellect into emotions, in other words, as I described last night, the shift from intellectual dominance into that opposite of emotional dominance, what happens is many of the people in the sixth sphere don't automatically connect to you as you would know and automatically think they would. Um, and that, that raises in itself, because they think you've gone strange you know, in many occasions. And um, and that's a, that's a problem that almost every celestial spirit um, has um, with dealing in the sixth sphere, with the sixth sphere. So um, what, I, what I would love to see is he continue his progress right the way through to at one moment with God and enjoys the beauty of being in that state with God. And then um, he, he will never lose his friends. He will always have the desire to teach. And if we could work together then in going back to the sixth sphere and bringing back sixth sphere spirits back down to discuss things with me on earth. And the reason why it helps better when I'm on earth is because when the sixth sphere spirit comes to discuss with something with me on earth, they're automatically connected with their earth life again, which means that they're automatically drawn back into thinking about their emotional harms when they were on the earth. And that has an automatic impact on them emotionally. So... Um, that's the beauty of having someone on earth who can actually speak through somebody to, to six sphere spirits. But it need, his friends may not all consider themselves to be his friends much anymore because of the shift that he personally has already made. And so um, it's not always as easy as what he may currently feel it might be to work together helping those six sphere spirits change. Because I've over 2,000 years, I've obviously done a lot of work attempting to help six fear spirits. But we can, I believe, have a larger effect on them on earth than we can uh, even in the spirit world because of this drawing them back to their earth life and remembering their earth life and therefore remembering emotion. Um, so I'd love to work with him together on that. And I'd also love to work with him together on my eyesight and my mm. problem with my... Um, I he also can see the problem I have across here on my body. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to listen to him about uh, what he feels emotionally those particular things are too. In relation to that, I received a download last night. Mm -hmm. um, and all he wanted to bring to your awareness was that upon reincarnation you've received other qualities that you're not aware of on your original journey yeah. um, and he was talking to me about my qualities that I have that a lot of um, spirits also look at the positive qualities that you have within you yep. and that that was not one of my focuses yep. and, um, and that some of those positive qualities also attract um, adverse spirits because they can attach into your negative qualities in order to work on the positive qualities to achieve what they want to achieve. Yep. Um, and one of those things was my strength as a soul to search for power, um, to be able to do things on this earth in a powerful manner, which was adverse to, um, I guess, the environment and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's just my use of my intellect and be able to use my position and, yeah. and do things. Um, so, so does he feel that uh, my eyesight I is about um, me not recognising or not allowing myself to recognise some of these qualities? And other truths um, yep. that, are, that is occurring um, in this... You know, see, I get distorted as to what, yep. um, through my own and emotional can I, filter, can so I just I'm not help quite him, understand it. There's an emotion he's feeling at the moment. He's sort of being... Uh, 
there's other spirits talking to him at the moment uh, who are related, who are celestial friends of mine. Um, that if he can allow himself to listen to them, um, they'll, he'll be able to say some other things as well. The only problem is I'm yeah, going through my emotions. Yeah, of course, of course. So, and, yeah. and we can easily, it doesn't have to be this time. Mm. Mm. I mean, there's another person here who can express it, um, if they're willing to do it, <laughs> just because I'm processing yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Cause what I find is I get disconnected and with the microphone, yeah. the frequency the change on pressure of yeah. the situation. And the yeah. frequency of it alters my connection as well. It's, or there's a false yeah, belief no, system. That, that's actually not a truth. It's, okay. it's, a, it's the emotions that are associated with you high mm. holding the microphone actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do you want to have the earpiece instead? Uh, <laughs> would you like me to identify a person who would be willing? Well, if uh, there is people in here who want to. It's just there's a fear stopping it as well. So I guess it's a free will. Well, it's a free will yeah. thing, and mm. I've invited anybody to. And this is the issue that we have often time with mediums, is that is that there are many who are capable of doing this work uh, with us, but quite a number who are yet to work through their emotions about doing it. And we, we would love to work with them, but a lot of the times they have deep emotions about doing it, and particularly about doing it also in public or having sessions recorded and things like that. And, and the reason why I do the recordings is because every single person then learns from what's happened, not just the people involved in the, in the session. So, so one of the reasons why we record almost all of our mediumship sessions now with people is because it teaches not only the person who is the medium doing the work right in that moment, but every single person listening gets some benefit out of, the, out of what's going on. Uh, the spirits involved, the medium herself, ourselves, and also any, any person who listens to the recording. So, so, um, but it just requires dealing with some of those emotions that you feel. And, so, and we'd love to help any person, by the way, who is mediumistic, to actually start um, doing, working in this way a lot more sort of deeply, if you like. Well, he's expressed there are 10 individuals in this room who, at this point, have the ability to do it yeah. quite clearly. There you go. Um, She's looking around, and you're one of them. <laughs> we'll put a line up afterwards, and you can point to each one of them. <laughs> Just have the microphone uh, the back. back there for a moment. Yeah, um, with the um, with our spirit friend who's made that transition onto the divine love path, which is wonderful. I can feel a lot of his emotions. Yeah, I, I can feel his emotions, and it's really lovely that he's making that uh, transition. Um, the the Feelings I have are that uh, we can work, certainly work together with those six sphere spirits and particularly I know he's interested in the Palladian, the spirits with the Palladian background. Um, and, but he is going to find that it is not going to be quite as simple as that because, because while he's now made this emotional shift, the people that he's left behind for this period of time that he's made the emotional shift from um, have yet to make that same emotional shift and as, as he can recall when he looks back he can see that yes he went through lots of like doubt and, and investigation in order to make that shift which is the same kind of doubt and investigation that these other spirits will have to make at some point so um, it should be very interesting to see what happens over the coming months we've had times uh, in the past where I've wanted to talk to six fear spirits for a period of time and sometimes it's been up to two or three years later that I've actually got to speak with them. And, um, and, and many of them have made shifts in that time. So, so for example, um, have any of you have heard of Ramtha? Yep. Well, Ramtha, I spoke with three years ago and he made a shift onto the Divine Love Path. Have, have any of you heard of the Oneness Blessing? You've heard of the Oneness Blessing, the Diksha movement? Um, I'm, I tried to contact the leaders of that movement in the spirit world um, uh, two, two and a half years ago. And, 
and I had my first opportunity to talk to them uh, about one month ago. Uh, so they are now on the Divine Love Path, the leaders of that movement in the spirit world. Uh, and of course they are looking at how they can help the, the movement on earth uh, enter that state. I've attempted to also talk to other leaders of other religious groups as well, including Buddha and also Muhammad, but I haven't had much success uh, in the, those connections as yet, as I've been trying to do for nearly 2,000 years on both of those connections. Um, but I'm finding the effect of a person on the earth talking to these ones is much more powerful than the effect of a spirit in the spirit world talking to these ones. And the reason why I can see quite clearly, which is this, when you draw them to you on the earth, now they're confronted with their whole earth existence as well. And any unresolved emotions or suppressed emotions they feel about that existence are automatically easily able to be exposed, just like I mentioned to him yesterday about the abuse issue that he was facing. So um, that's a very powerful way of helping people shift. And uh, so I'm, in, I'm definitely wanting to do much more of that. So all of you who are interested in mediumship, um, there's a lot of work to do. And what I've been trying to do is whole sessions on the internet now, um, trying to train mediums to actually connect in this different way to get to a point where eventually we can have a whole team, teams of mediums, helping large numbers of spirits on a daily basis to progress. It's a very, very rewarding process because many of these spirits are in a, have a deep desire to change. It's not like people on earth, like, like for me to convince you that I'm Jesus, I'm going to have to do much more probably than I already have, right? For me to convince the spirit that I'm Jesus is very simple. Um, and therefore, uh, that automatically establishes a trust relationship with them and, uh, and uh, that can be easily established. And, and so there is automatically then a much more d stronger desire for them to listen. And oftentimes they also have, a, they have been in darkness. Many, many of the lower spirits in the first and second sphere have been in darkness for such a long period of time that they now have a burning desire to get out of the darkness. And, uh, and they are just right to be assisted. We, we just don't have enough people on earth who are willing to assist them. Um, sorry about that. What, yeah, are, you, what are you hang feeling? On. If you just oh. talk through Mary's microphone there. <laughs> <laughs> There's an easy way around. It was supposed to be quicker, but it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening with me is I've got this, um, I'm feeling this terror. I've got a lot of vibration, a lot of vibration running through my... I'm getting a lot of vibration running through my body. Um, it's like I'm not, a, I'm controlling it, <laughs> I'm not allowing it fully to express itself. But so, firstly, allow it. Yeah, it's, so just it starts off here and then just it goes through. Yeah, it's fear, and it's fear from your childhood with connections with spirits. So, if if you can allow yourself to start connecting to the fear that you felt when you were little, when you saw spirits or connected to spirits or felt them around. Um, and just allow yourself to process your way through that emotionally rather than holding on to the fear. At the moment, what you're trying to do a lot is sort of like rigidly control the fear and keep it under wraps. Mm -hmm. If you just allow yourself to go into the fear state and even have cry with it, you'll release some of this childhood fear and you'll actually feel a lot more relaxed about uh, communicating with spirits as a result, even in a public setting. Um, some good movies that might assist uh, that was